All right, the conversation part of the buffet this evening. <laughs> Thank you for that reading. You're welcome. Um, I, okay, so I don't know whether everyone here subscribes to Outlook magazine. <laughs> Probably a little hard to get. This issue has this extraordinary uh, 20,000 word essay that Arundhati has just written in the last month. Yeah? Well, two days before I two came here. Two days before she came, she was <laughs> finishing it. It's um, her walk in the, in the forests with the Maoist insurgency. And I exhort you to go and read it, or if a publisher is shortly to publish it, to buy it. Um, and we need to talk about this because this is your latest work and it's an extraordinary piece. Um, Exclusive 32-page essay. <laughs> I, I wish we could just have a reading party first. Um, first of all, um, what was, I, I guess we have to lay a little bit of the landscape. You described a little bit about the economic stakes in the Civil War. Um, most of the reporting that we get, those of us who uh, go the extra distance to get some international news, uh, understand that there's some sort of Civil War going on with a Maoist insurgency. We remember that uh, your prime minister called it the gravest internal security threat to India uh, the year before last, no, last in year. 2000 and 2005. In 2005. And, and the stakes are getting higher. You've mm -hmm. been writing about uh, this movement for a while. You've been vilified for doing so. Um, and now you've just spent two weeks walking with an invisible army in the forest. So what was it like? Well, basically, um, I think what's interesting is that if you look at what's going on in that part of the world, starting in Afghanistan to Waziristan to the Northwest Frontier Provinces, through the Northeast of India to West Bengal, Jharkhand, Orissa, what you're seeing is a tribal uprising. Uh, sometimes it takes on the face of radical Islam. And here it's uh, basically radical communism. But the assault on tribal lands is a corporate, imperial corporate assault, you know? So that's, that's quite interesting. And in, in India, th this, this, these states are known as the Red Corridor in the press. It's extraordinary reading some of the stuff, the red yeah. baiting language it, that exists in the just, official discourse in India it's today. It's just crazy. And, and uh, though the Maoist movement in, in different shapes and forms, you know, first started in 1967 in India and it's always been wiped out, exterminated, it comes back and so on. But it's in this tribal area. Some of us call it the MOUist corridor, not the red, the Maoist corridor, the MOU as in the Memorandum of Understanding corridor, because if you look at a map of India, the forests, the minerals, the indigenous people, and the Maoist movement are all stacked up on top of each other. But, but at the moment, these memoranda are their corporate contracts. They're, we don't know what's in them because they're secret, but they haven't gone into, to what extent have they gone into effect? To what extent well, is extraction this is what, taking this place? This is what is extraordinary. You know, in 2005, billions of dollars worth of MOUs were signed for bauxite, for iron ore, and so on. And at that time, the prime minister suddenly says, Maoists are the gravest internal security threat in India, at a time when they were certainly not a security threat. In fact, they had just been wiped out of, of, uh, of um, Andhra Pradesh. They had lost some 1,600 of their cadre. So it was an odd thing to say. But the stocks of these mining companies went soaring in the, in the stock market because they realized that the prime minister was now signaling that he was going to go in. And um, there were, uh, you know, the Tata signed a big, uh, mm, big contract for an integrated steel plant. This is the big steel conglomerate. The big in steel India. Congl mm. conglomerate and another company called SR. And so it was interesting that 2005, the MOUs were signed. 2005, this people's militia was formed. 2005, the Prime Minister makes a statement. 2005, a jungle warfare training school starts, and now they're planning to have 20 of them or something in India. These are the paramilitaries going after the Maoists. Yeah, and, and, and of course, the people's militia, it started off um, with 
with the sort of Vietnam style, you know, strategic hamleting, which was to go in and burn villages and make people move out into police camps. Uh, and if you didn't move out, then you were a Maoist. So in fact, what happened is that for uh, tribal people in, in the forest, just living at home was a dangerous is a dangerous terrorist activity. So now they're all living in the forest, uh, scared to come back to their villages. And, uh, so, so, and we need to get to your actual experience, but let's lay a little bit more ground. There is a Maoist insurgency, which is connected to movements in the 60s and 70s that has been moving from state to state as in some ways landed here. But there's also an indigenous population, the, the tribals or the Adivasi people, who have also been resisting uh, uh, in different ways the, the Indian state for, for many more decades. So explain, if you can, the intersection between these between these separate movements, which are co-inhabiting co the struggle? Well, actually, they've always been, uh, the, the Maoist movement has always been mostly in tribal areas. Um, and, and of course, the tribal people in India have a history of resistance that predates Mao by some centuries. You know, so there is a coincidence of, of these two things. But basically, uh, right now, I would say that in the area where I visited, 99.9% .9 of the, or more, I mean, almost 100% of this, uh, the, the guerrilla army are indigenous people. And of them, the fascinating thing is that 45% of the armed Kada are women. So it was, I went in with some of my own prejudices about, you know, that women are the victims of armed struggle and so on. Left-wing movements being doctrinaire and patriarchal? Mm. Where would you get that? <laughs> it's Don't, true. Weird. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and then you've found some extraordinary women. So, but, but to be clear, this mm. is a movement whose, who's, you know, chief spokespeople speak in clear terms about a violent overthrow of the Indian state in very stultified classic left doctrine, Language. which shares a lot with yeah. Stalinism. Right, the way they talk? Yeah, the, the ideologues can be Stalinist. And they kill know? people? They kill people, but they don't kill people uh, in some senseless, crazy way as is made out, you know, because they are, they, now what's happening is there are these huge paramilitary camps and police go in groups of 300 or 1,000, surround a village, burn it, rape the women. You know, and so, and, and they're trying to do what they call creeping reoccupation. So, in fact, um, a lot of the, I mean, I don't know when there's a war like that on, uh, obviously the Indian media tries to make out that the Maoists are some crazy bunch of people who just go around killing. It's not the case, mm -hmm. you know, at least not from my uh, understanding of what's going on there at all. So, so we need to share a little bit of your experience of these two weeks of walking through the forest. It starts with a note slipped under your door. Yeah, it started with a note. I actually been waiting. Uh, I had, uh, you know, been called through someone, through someone, through someone and asked whether I would be prepared to go into the forest, uh, <clears throat> you know, for some weeks. So I said, sure. Because there's so many lies and there's so much subterfuge and, you know, half the newspapers and TV channels have mining interests and so you just don't know what's true, what's not true and so I... Uh, and, and I guess even as someone who has been trying to introduce a more nuanced view of this insurgency for a decade at least, yeah. you still hadn't spent time among its members. In no, I mean, you can't spend time amongst my members because they are all in, in, in the forest. And it's, um, and, and I was, you know, I mean, the decade has also, for me, been a decade where I've watched the great Gandhian nonviolent movements just being humiliated and, and kicked out, you know. Every single institution that they approached had humiliated them. All those dams were going up. And, uh, you know, more and more you could see as the economic policies were <clears throat> pushing in, India had to become a police state because you fundamental to doing these big infrastructural projects is pushing people off their land. So, it, you know, there was this kind of convulsion. And uh, 
Anyway, so I, um, I, I, I sort of indicated that I would be, you know, quite happy to go in. And then I just got this note saying, you know, giving me a place where I had to be on two consecutive days, uh, four different timings, and it said, uh, you know, writer shall have a copy of the Hindu Outlook, Hindi Outlook magazine, and a red tikka and folded up newspaper and a yeah and a trench and, coat. Yeah, so I was like, okay, I was and and the password was going to be Namaskar Guruji. So I thought maybe they were expecting a man, you know, <laughs> and should I get a moustache? <laughs> and then I, uh, anyway, I, I was there and uh, it was very sweet because my first encounter was with the gravest internal security threat was this little kid who came up to me with like red nail polish and he, he was supposed to have an outlook and a banana and so on. Right. I say, Namaskar, Guruji. And he just came to me and said, you want to go in? I said, hey, what? <laughs> <laughs> then I said, what about, what about, he said. Where's the banana, he, dude? Where's, oh, where's the banana? He said, I was very hungry, I ate it. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then he gave me a little note saying, outlook nahi mila, meaning I couldn't, we couldn't find an outlook. <laughs> and, so <laughs> I went with him, and he had this little backpack. Reality just doesn't disappoint. Yeah. He had this little backpack which said, Charlie Brown, not your ordinary blockhead. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I mean, that's how I started my, my walk into the forest, which just, it was just the most, uh, uh, the most amazing experience. I mean, walking for, for nights and nights and nights and weeks, two weeks, two and a half weeks I was there, sleeping outdoor. I mean, so you were in a, their underground bunkers with the sophisticated security systems, <laughs> the, the heat-seeking yeah. missiles and Where the, they're the buying, infrastructure they're buying, of insurgency. Yeah, which yeah. they're buying from Mossad. With, for, right. I wish I could, I wish I could uh, show you pictures, you know, of, of, of what it was like, but anyway. So, so, you, you, so, so what, what, what is the situation for the people with whom you walked? And to what extent did you feel that you got uh, an unfiltered, an unsculptured look at what their reality is? Well, you know, the thing is that we walked so much and through so many villages, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not somebody who hasn't been through villages and things before, so, so you know how to, I know how to read the signs, you know and the smiles and the, you know, walking uh, through parts where you meet bunches of little kids, you know, everyone saying Lal Salam, red salute, you know. It's, it, it, I don't think it was, I don't think I got a, I don't think they, you know, they can control it in to, to you know, in such a large area and so mm -hmm. on. And you're just walking. And you're just walking, and you're camping never more than a night in a place, and sometimes only a few hours. Sometimes you're like, <laughs> have dinner, go to sleep. Sorry, you've got to walk now. We can't stay. It's not safe. To what extent did it feel uh, dangerous, like a war zone? Did you see any action? Was there a sense that, um, no, that violence could erupt? Look, I had been... To the, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a river called the Indravati. And when you cross that river, the police call it Pakistan. Right. And they say that uh, I had been there before, not gone into the forest, but into the, you know, the outside. And the police, I had met this superintendent of police who told me that uh, when you cross the river, we shoot to kill. And uh, I have a, you know, I've, I heard a recording of the, of a former superintendent of police instructing his men how to burn every village that doesn't surrender, surrender, and to kill any journalist who goes to cover the area. You know, so when you're right inside, you're less, um, less worried, but when you're near the, what they call the border, then it's worrying. And every day you're getting news of people who are being killed, and I met a lot of families who's, you know, who had lost family members who had been killed by the police or by the 
Salva Jurum. So, so, so this piece came out, you know, in a, in a major, major Indian magazine. It came out two days ago. Mm. And the cover has you with a bunch of rebels, and the title is Walking with the Comrades. In it, you describe them as a true people's army. You, you speak at the end in, I think, fairly, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but fairly romantic terms about some of the young women that you met and the hope that, that, that you see in them for creating some sort of alternative society. You must be getting hammered for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'll tell you what it was. I mean, it's not, it, it wasn't the hope of an alternative society for the whole world. It was an alternative to their own annihilation, you know? It was people who are standing up and fighting and saying, we're not going to move, you know? And we're not going to buy into your morality. And a lot of the women that I met, what I found remarkable was that many of them had joined after having watched their villages burn, after having watched their comrades or friends actually having watched them being raped and killed, because this movement has predated this whole mining thing by 30 years, you know. So for 30 years, they've been working in the, walking in the forest and working in the forest. And there's literally, it's like there's 90,000 members of the Krantikari Adivasi Mahila Sangatan, which is the revolutionary women's movement. I mean, those are straight down 90,000 Maoists. Are you going to kill them all, you know? Is the government going to kill them? So a lot of the women had joined even to get away from the traditional patriarchy of their own society. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what's nice about it, that it's not romantic. Oh, look at these wonderful tribal people. Everything they do must be right. Beautiful, you know, and, and yes, beautiful. in harmony with No, it's, it's something that's alive and there, you know? And um, to, see though, to, to see that they are fighting to not be annihilated, because that's what's, that, you know, they've laid siege to the forest. They're not, it's not that they're going to go in and kill everybody, but the problem is that the markets are full of informers. People can't go out. People can't go to their villages. As it is, it's a population that's living on the brink of starvation. Mm -hmm. So... Um, they had one doctor that you saw. They had one doctor who had, who had been, I mean, they had never had a doctor for so many years. Now they had one doctor, you know? And the medical and situation was... Uh, the medical situation dying. is dire. They can't go to the market and buy provisions because they're told that, oh, you're feeding the Maoists. You know, so... Now, I, I know that this story is, you don't like to make the story about you, but I, 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 I need to ask you about, about, about what it's like for you in this moment. I just want to convey for, for the audience a little bit of the environment in which you live. I found a, a short piece from, from, from two weeks ago in the Economic Times, which I assume is a important, fancy, reputable Indian newspaper. Um, and this was when the Maoist uh, leader had, had suggested that there might be a ceasefire if you and some other intellectuals in India would serve as mediators, a role that you quite sensibly rejected, um, being, as you said, unqualified. <laughs> yeah. um, um, but, but this was how it was described in a, in a major Indian newspaper. Maoist leader Kishenji has named renowned cop basher, a regular <laughs> at the capital's grievance-mongering seminars, Arundhati Roy, and rebel Trinamool Congress leader Kavir Suman, who flaunts his sympathy for the red menace as possible mediators for talks with the government. The government is sure to reject this offer, as the two names suggested by the Maoist leaders share a wacky state is an oppressor prejudice. The two police-loathing personalities have been routinely bombarding the media with deep thoughts and cherry-picked data to paint the police and the establishment as real culprits. So this is a fairly mild <laughs> yeah, description mild. of Normally of it's India. like, hang Arundhati Roy, right. send her out to the country. So, but, but seriously, this, this, this major piece in a major magazine, which is being presented with all of that legitimacy, is going to be a marker in the public understanding of this struggle and of the ability of the state to dehumanize this resistance. And you've put yourself out there once again. 
So what has it been like <laughs> so far? Well, and what are, what I think are, what I did a wise doing? thing by leaving before right. it was <laughs> published. <laughs> Publish and depart. <laughs> Publish and depart. <laughs> no, actually, there's one, one thing that we should talk about is what's going on with the Indian media. It's, it's really, I mean, it's like Fox News on steroids, you know? Some of the <laughs> channels. It's really Fox on Coke. I mean, it's yeah. More, more Coke than steroids. Yeah, I think you're yeah. Right. Like, there are, there, uh, there are, you know, I don't know if, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term encounter, but in India, it's a very common word uh, where the police kill X in an encounter. You're allowed There's to kill... an encounter with guerrillas. Hmm, you're allowed to kill Muslims and you're allowed to kill Maoists in encounters. And you have encounter specialists. And the more people they kill, the more rewards they get, the more bravery awards and all of that, you know? And um, there have been so many incidents of, uh, I mean, completely fake encounters, but there are no questions asked. You can just go and kill. So uh, if you ask a question, then you're a cop basher. You know, how dare you question the police? Like the police are always right, you know? And um, unfortunately, for example, in, in Kashmir a few years ago, um, a family received an anonymous note from actually from an army officer saying that your son has been killed and has been uh, buried as an Afghan militant in Kupwara, mm -hmm. which is a border town in Kashmir. And actually it turned out that these four laborers who had gone to Kupwara to do some fencing work or something for the army had been killed and called militants because then you get promotions, you get rewards and so on. And this whole thing was... Um, so you put a uniform on them after they're dead. Yeah, yeah. In Colombia, they call it false positives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Phenomenon. In fact, this happens all the time. In, in this essay, the, so many of the villagers told me, you know, the police, they come and they always bring uniforms so that whoever they kill, they put uniforms on and then they can get, uh, you know, rewards for... But this is happening, meaning all the time there. And um, if, you, if you ask these questions, like when the Mumbai attack happened, just before that, there had been an encounter in Delhi where they had gone in and killed some four students, some four Muslim students. And some of us had raised questions about it. And during the Mumbai attacks, um, on the Fox News on Coke channel, <laughs> there, there's a policeman who was being interviewed and he said, now will you call Arundhati Roy and you know, she'll come and criticize the police and if it wasn't for us, you know, how would you manage her and so on. And so the news reader looks at the TV and says, Arundhati Roy, I hope you're watching this. We think you're disgusting. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> We. But we. We, yeah. But on the other hand, you know, you have to understand that this is such a small section, very powerful people, but a very, very small section of people. And the rest of it, it's completely the other way around. You know, on the last night in the forest, the only communication you have, obviously, is the radio. And there was a BBC Hindi radio program we were listening to on the Naxal, on the Maoist issue. And uh, the, the, the presenter kept saying 85% of the people calling in were supporting them, you know? And there was a brief period when they were legalized. Ah, that it keeps some, happening. Some years Comes ago. Comes and goes, yeah. And they, have, they, they, they turn out a lot yeah. of people when they have rallies. Yeah, right. huge. So uh, we're gonna end this evening with Aaron Dottie's gonna do another short reading, but, but, but before we do that, um, there's a couple of other quick things I'd like to cover. Um, last year, I read an interview with you in which you said that you resented the idea that the whole world has to be interested in American elections. <laughs> which, uh, which as, a, as, a, as a Canadian who was covering the elections at the time, I felt, I felt a great kinship. Uh, uh, and, I'm, and I'm delighted to have spent an entire evening uh, in, in a non-self-reflexive examination of the politics of this country, no matter how vital they are to, the, to, to what happens in the world. But I, I did feel reading the book, 
and I do feel reading your work of the last few years, that there are some uh, astonishing parallels uh, between, uh, between these two uh, great democracies with, with all the quotation marks required. Um, and I, and I want to just tease a couple of them out um, here at the end where it's safe. We haven't put it up front. <laughs> the, the need, um, a, as people fall through uh, the, the gaping cracks, as an economic model leaves the vast majority of a, of a country's people behind, and in the United States, the, the last two bubbles um, were, were, were marked really by the leaving behind of the middle class and the descent of the middle class and in huge parts of it into poverty in this country. And now we have official statistics that verify what was the truth for, for a majority of people in this country for the last couple of decades, increasingly. And it, it, it almost seems that, this, that the, the natural anger of those people for, for the, the, the betrayal of the, of the middle class promise that was made to them has got to go somewhere. And the exploitation of that anger and the rise of, of ugliness in, 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 in political discourse, in, in media, whatever drug they're doing, whatever channel they, space they occupy, uh, is characteristic of this moment. What if, in your study of India and the, the lumbering of the democratic institutions, in some cases, it, you argue towards fascism, what, what have you learned that you think that this country uh, needs to look out for? Or, or what do you sense in the, in the two situations which might actually lead us to some productive way of responding? See, I, I, um, you know, I, I think there are, as you say, these parallels, but the, <clears throat> the difference is that in America, even while huge sections of the population fall out of the basket, they're still in the system, you know? I mean, in India, the, the difference is that such a lot of people are just, they've never been a part of the system, like the tribal people. I mean, the state has never done anything for them. They don't have numbers or addresses or car, you know? They don't exist for the state. They don't exist, and in a way, that, uh, that gives the resistance a whole new dimension, you know? The possibility of the imagination, or, you know, the imagination is different there. So uh, one of the reasons that I think I was so interested in what was happening here is not because uh, these people are going to be able to put up to the world an alternative for the whole world. But what they are saying, and I am with them on this, is that you can't have the river, water from our rivers, you can't have the bauxite from our mountain, you can't have the iron ore from the forest floor. Now you make do with what you have. And once in, in the world of the free market, once you have to accommodate that, somebody saying enough. There is a domino effect, you know, and, you, and people will have to find alternatives to the endless rampaging through other people's ecologies and other people's wealth and other people's freedoms, you know. So right now the difference between India and America is that even though there are a huge number of poor Americans, Still, this economy is preying on economies outside the borders. Mm -hmm. Whereas in India, it's colonized itself. You know, so it's making war on its own people. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, I mean, it's been doing that since the mo moment it became a, a sovereign power. It's, it, there was a smooth transition there. Yeah, like from 1947 onwards, it's made war in Nagaland, Manipur, Kashmir, Assam. Telangana, Goa, Punjab, you know, it's just been protracted war. When I, when, but when, I, when, when you read to us some of the doctrine of the Hindu nationalists and you compare it to some of the talk in this country, mm. the, it's not a small thing. The biggest talk show in America that dwarfs all of its competitors by millions of viewers. The host speaks regularly of progressivism as a cancer. And yeah. we know that when you get into the medical metaphors, you're talking about eradication. Yeah. You're talking about vermin. Yeah. You're using language that, that you have been identifying for a decade or more uh, in the rise of, of, a, of a type of fascism in, in, uh, in India. 
and the Tea Party movement, which has exploded in the last uh, week in this country in some, some more ugly incidents of types that we've seen, um, of racism, of homophobia in the halls of Congress. Um, there's no, I don't think there's any comparison in the levels uh, yeah. uh, of virulence, of violence, of the human toll. Um, but, there, but, but there are people who are dispossessed who are not completely off the radar, yeah. who are angry, who are being used, and whose anger is being channeled. It will be very frightening. I mean, this is true in India, too, that eventually, if you... If you uh, there are so many subcutaneous levels of unhappiness, right? I mean, as we know, the Taliban is now an, a radical Islamist <laughs> uprising, but it is fighting an occupation, you know? Similarly, in India, like, if you look at the, at the war, uh, at, at the killing of Christians in Orissa, Actually, behind that whole thing, there's a bauxite mountain. And the problem is that when you start destroying movements like this, which at least speak the language of justice, you end up with completely lumpenized, criminalized, reactionary politics, uh, which I think you could see here too very, 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 very soon, you know? Mm. And the causes will be what our analysis says it is, but the manifestation will be terrible. And I don't know how, uh, you know, I don't know how that process can be reversed because I don't think that the alternative can come from the imagination that created the problem in the first place. You know, it'll have to come from people who have been left out of this. Who are free to dream something yeah, better. Yeah, and, who, and who, uh, who will resist it because they don't have a choice. I find this uh, really shocking that people who, um, who are middle class uh, find it so easy to stop hoping. Whereas people who have nothing don't have an option, you know, so they do not give up hope. And to whom did you dedicate this book? Yeah, this book is dedicated to those who have, who know how to divorce hope from reason. <laughs> I'll clap for that. <laughs> Why don't, why don't you um, sanctify the divorce with the final reading? <laughs> okay. I'll just read for a minute. <clears throat> Perhaps the story of the Siachen Glacier, the highest battlefield in the world, is the most appropriate metaphor for the insanity of our times. Thousands of Indian and Pakistani soldiers have been deployed there, enduring chill winds and temperatures that dip to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Of the hundreds who've died there, <clears throat> many have died from the cold, from frostbite and sunburn. The glacier has become a garbage dump now, littered with the detritus of war. Thousands of empty artillery shells, empty fuel drums, ice axes, old boots, tents, and every other kind of waste that thousands of warring human beings generate. The garbage remains intact, perfectly preserved at those icy temperatures, a pristine monument to human folly. While the Indian and Pakistani governments spent billions of dollars on weapons and the logistics of high altitude warfare, the battlefield has begun to melt. Right now, it has shrunk to about half its size. The melting has less to do with the military standoff than with people far away on the other side of the world living the good life. They are good people who believe in peace and free speech and in human rights. They live in thriving democracies whose governments sit on the UN Security Council and whose economies depend heavily on the export of war and the sale of weapons to countries like India and Pakistan and Rwanda, Sudan, Somalia, the Republic of Congo, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's a long list. The glacial melt will cause severe floods in the subcontinent and eventually severe drought, 
that will affect the lives of millions of people. And that will give us even more reasons to fight. We'll need more weapons. Who knows, that sort of consumer confidence may be just what the world needs to get over the current recession. Then everyone in the thriving democracies will have an even better life and the glaciers will melt even faster. While I read listening to grasshoppers to a tense audience packed into a university auditorium in Istanbul, tense because words like unity, progress, genocide and Armenian tend to anger the Turkish authorities when they are uttered close together. But I could see Raquel Dink, Haran Dink's widow, sitting in the front row, crying the whole way through. When I finished, she hugged me and said, we keep hoping. Why do we keep hoping? We, she said, not you. The words of Fez, Ahmed Fez, sung so hauntingly by Abida Parveen came to me. Nahi nigah me manzil to justju hi sahi. Nahi visal mayasar to arzu hi sahi. I tried to translate them for her, sort of. If dreams are thwarted, then yearning must take their place. If reunion is impossible, then longing must take its place. You see what I meant about poetry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>